morning. I am here this morning uh, with these three gentlemen, and we're going to discuss a lawsuit uh, that has been filed on behalf of the Chickasaw Nation and the Choctaw Nation. And so this morning, uh, we have Governor Bill Anatubby with the Ch Chickasaws. Hello, Kelly. Hello there. <laughs> uh, we have Chief Batten. Yes, Holly Tobe. And we have Mike Burridge, the attorney representing these two tribes. Uh, um, I am going to let Mike kind of set us up this morning and tell you a little bit about this lawsuit, its origin, and uh, what they hope to accomplish. Well, well thank you. Uh, this lawsuit was filed in the uh, federal court in Oklahoma City and has been pending for about 10 years. And what it deals with is the unallotted lands that the Choctaws and Chickasaws owned in 1906, even though the nations owned this land, the government passed a statute uh, that they were going to sell it. And they took the land and they sold it. The promise was legal title to the land and the continuation of these sovereign tribal governments. This land and all its assets were to be protected by the federal government under a trust relationship. Yet through this trust relationship, our tribes were stripped of their land and assets, resulting in the impoverishment of our people and the eradication of our cultural identity. This betrayal of tribal trust is the focus of our initiative. Uh, the statute required the land to be sold a certain way, and the nations uh, really don't know what happened to the land. They've never been given an accounting, a full accounting. And so this lawsuit was filed. Uh, the federal government passed a statute that says the um, uh, Department of Interior needs to account for what they did with this property. And so that's what the lawsuit's about. You took the land and you did something with it and please account to us and tell us what you did with it and where the funds are. Okay, so this land was, a, it was connected with the Trail of Tears. And the people that were relocated here, and they um, moved here, a lot of them were just uprooted and moved, and it caused a great emotional upheaval in your tribes. Governor, can you speak a little bit about the long-term ramifications that, that this has had for your people? Well, you know, uh, it's difficult oftentimes for people to identify uh, unless they've experienced it themselves. Mm -hmm. However, I think people can better understand if they place themself, themselves in uh, someone else's shoes. In the case of these tribes and uh, other tribes, we were uprooted from our homeland, which we'd lived there for g many, many generations. And we were told to take what you can take with you and you're going to a new land. In this case, it was Indian Territory. And many walked from, in our case, Mississippi to Indian Territory. Others rode in wagons. It, it uh, was a traumatic experience for our people. However, when we got to Indian Territory, we began to establish ourselves once again. We began to develop school systems, governmental systems, economic systems, and we began to plant our roots down in Indian Territory. And we were told by treaty that this land would be, the, be ours. It would never be a state or part of a state, and we would hold it in basically in perpetuity that uh, as long as the grass grows and the water flows. And you've heard that terminology, but it was actually in, in our treaties. So we looked at it as ours, and uh, we continued to uh, grow, to have our, our children would grow up within our own uh, society. We had our own culture, our own values, and they're high values, by the way. And we, uh, we, we prospered uh, under our own uh, government and our own, uh, within our own society. And then of course that was interrupted uh, once again when Oklahoma became a state. There were several things that led up to that. You know, several laws that were passed. One was the uh, Allotment Act, which was intended to break up the land that was uh, held by the Chickasaw Nation 
and other tribes. And we held land in common. We would have a particular tract of land that we could utilize for uh, our families, for crops or for business or whatever to uh, benefit our family and the community. And so actual land ownership was rather foreign to us. But the Allotment Act did in fact break up uh, the land holdings uh, into individual ownership. So that was foreign. And then uh, we were operating under a government. In our case, we had a, a governor, we had a legislature, we had a complete judicial system. And uh, it was intended to break that government up, uh, so to make way for settlement and make way for a new state. And so, uh, it, again, uh, we were holding land that was told that we would have in perpetuity. Uh, that was not, uh, that word was not lived up to. Uh, we became part of a state, which again, we were told we would not be part of a state. In addition, the lands that were, that were not uh, allotted uh, were then, by law, by federal law, were sold. We, we discussed this a little bit earlier. Uh, Chief Batten, you want to talk to us a little bit about how um, the government took control of the, the tribal nation and, and appointed chiefs. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, definitely. I mean, I don't know that, well, first of all, Kelly Yako Key, which means mm -hmm. thank you for, for having <laughs> us here today. And and uh, for me, but- You're welcome, the, but I I don't know how to say that. How do I say you're welcome? Uh, uh, you would just say Chimichukma. That sounds hard. <laughs> okay, I'll work on that. Okay, but uh, but really, when we we the Treaty Dance in Rabbit Creek that was mm -hmm. signed, and when we were removed here to to Oklahoma, from that time until 1983, that actually the the President of the United States appointed a chief or a governor over our tribes. And so they were, like I said, and I don't think people realize that we were a society, we were a government. Uh, we weren't just a social group out there. And we do truly have this treaty, not just a compact, but a treaty with the United States. And so for us, they became our trustee. I mean, they would hold, would take care of us basically. And by appointing these presidents, uh, I mean the governors and the chiefs, through many years, a lot of times what happened is if they wouldn't do exactly what the tribes wanted to do, then they would replace that chief or the governor. It was not until 1983 that we regained our constitution. Both of our governments did, and then we actually held elections and then became the governor and the chief of the Choctaw Nation. And that was a turning point, really, for the tribes, was it not? I mean, to be able to start regrouping yourselves and, and kind of set yourselves up so you could look into some of these situations. Well, definitely, we have allowed us to become a democratic right. um, a nation again right. and uh, to represent our people mm -hmm. and to go after the things that our people wanted us to, to do, just like the governor and I are entrusted to make sure that we look out, and that's part of this case. And right. I don't think people realize, again, that this was a, a lot of timber that was sold throughout all these years, billions of dollars. And again, we're not looking at the dollar side of it, but the accounting of it, if the federal government could just tell us how they, how they sold the timber, how much it was sold for, all those types of things, we would feel much better about mm -hmm. this situation. And Mike, in, you, in your research, have you found instances where the timber was handled maybe inappropriately? Yes, we, there, there are instances. Uh, it, it appears from what we've been able to find so far is that uh, this land uh, ended up with the timber companies and uh, the statute provided how it was to be sold uh, and of course it was supposed to be sold at a fair and reasonable price, there was to be appraisals, there were track size limitations and so forth mm -hmm. and uh, we have not been able to find that that statute was complied with and uh, there was possibly some corruption and uh, that's why you have these large timber companies that have these large tracts of land. And you know, and the tragic part about it is that uh, these nations, if they had not been robbed, <clears throat> excuse me, robbed of this property, they could be making the same kind of money 
that these timber companies have made, the billions of dollars that they've made over the years. So, uh, uh, but going back to what this is about is, it would like if you own your home, mm -hmm. and uh, you think you've bought your home, you think you own it, and the government comes in and says, we're taking it. And it's supposed to be for a public purpose if it's eminent domain, and you're supposed to receive fair and just compensation. Mm -hmm. And so your home's taken, and you say, well, did I get any money for it? You know, what happened to it? And that's what this case is about, broken down simple. You, you took our land. Uh, what did you do with it? Uh, who's got the money? And so forth. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of the collective um, emotional toll that through the generations that this has, has impacted your, your people and your nation. Governor, do you want to speak to that? Well, you know, the, the first stage of this was a removal from our homeland into Indian Territory. Mm -hmm. And that was traumatic. We did seem to begin the process of recovering from that because we began to flourish in the Indian Territory. However, uh, once again, uh, our people were, uh, what they had was taken away from them. Uh, and our, in our culture, uh, when you, in all cultures, you move from one to another, there's oftentimes culture shock, and that, in fact, happened to our people. They didn't always understand what, how the other society functioned. Uh, and when uh, land was allotted to them, oftentimes uh, they would lose their land because they weren't familiar with the uh, property law of, of the new state. And in some instances, there were people that, that actually, I would, I'll go ahead and use the word, they were, they were cheated out of their property in one way or another. And if you read the, the book uh, by Angie DeBow and Still the Waters Run, mm -hmm. or Still the Waters Flow, you, you get some specific instances of what occurred in, the, in uh, Indian Territory or after in Eastern Oklahoma. But we had people that uh, their, their whole way of life changed. And when you have that change, some people are able to make the change and others aren't. And because of the trauma involved, it creates difficulty within the families themselves. And you know, that's what we are as, as Indian nations. We're families. Right. We're all connected in some way or another. And so family, uh, families begin to break down. Some made it out. They were able to get out of the, the area and they were able to make good. They, they were able to be successful. But many of our people were left behind. Mm -hmm. And so it had a real traumatic effect on our people. And is that, is that sometimes passed generationally? It, because if the trauma impacts, and then as time goes on, if the parent is more wounded, then the child may tend to be more wounded. That's, that's correct. So it's, I think it, it happens it's not only to American Indians, but it happens in society It does. As a whole. It happens in all families. Yeah, it you, takes you, a you long have a breakdown, and then right. it carries forward, uh, in fact, several generations. Right. In, right. Our, in our society, to, uh, it has moved from, you know, like, alcoholism, mm -hmm. and then when uh, drugs became uh, prevalent uh, in, right. in our area, then the drugs also have had a negative effect on families. Mm -hmm. and of course, we're working as a, as a government to help restore these families. It's a big deal for us. We, we're very anxious to, to help our families. Sure. But these things, like you said, are generational, and it takes a while for us to work with that. So our, mm -hmm. our tribes were devastated by these acts of the federal government. Right. Uh, and we're just now being able to restore uh, some of that self-esteem and self-confidence 
and to restore the governments themselves. Right. Well, and that's the reason why we call it the tragedy of the broken trust is because it has been generational uh, mm -hmm. things that have caused our tribal members no different than any other society that when they lose their self-esteem mm -hmm. because I keep saying our tribal members focused on faith, family, and culture mm -hmm. and uh, to go from that to money and when they used to barter with each other and, and they lived in a society like you said where uh, trust was at the foremost I mean if you gave your word that right. was it right. and to go from that to, to not uh, being trusted. I mean, a lot of our tribal members today, you can, I can still drive up in our tribal vehicle, uh -huh. and if there's more than two people, the doors will not open. They, you can knock on the door, you know somebody's in that house, but they still will not open that door just because they're afraid of who's coming to check on them, what's going on, why are they there. Wow. And so, to me, you see that. And of course, it is kind of sad, as Governor is saying, you know, we still see the alcohol and substance abuse. And it's begin because they're trying to fit into mainstream society, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to, to do that because they don't know uh, their culture. A lot of that has been lost. And we've uh, lost that through, uh, through the years. And mm -hmm. to know that you can be Choctaw, you can be Chickasaw, mm -hmm. and function in today's society, and I mean, and I'm trying to do a lot of that. Just even the word Oklahoma is a Choctaw word. Mm -hmm. uh, Homa is, is red and Oklahoma is people. And, but most people of our tribal members don't even know that. We're trying to restore the language. But all of the, the language and our, just all of our family unit was just devastated. Wow. And like I said, and that's, that's the impact that it's had on us. And we're doing our best to try to regain that culture, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's going to be difficult mm -hmm. to, to make it happen again. An insult to injury uh, had to do with the federal policies. Mm -hmm. One was that our people could were prohibited from speaking their language or practicing their culture. And that's uh, part of what I think Chief was alluding to. Mm -hmm. We're restoring that now. Uh, when you're told that you're a bad person if you mm -hmm. speak your language, I mean, that's how they mm -hmm. receive that message, right. or you're a bad person because you want to have a stomp dance, or you right. want to practice your culture in some way, uh, then that is part of what takes that self-esteem away. You, your identity is attacked. Right. Your identity, you're told that your identity is bad, right. and you can't practice that anymore. And it was, it was a federal policy that, that was turned around. Uh, it was a federal law, and when I said it was a federal policy, Right. It was federal law. And then, later on, that law was reversed, but the effects of that law carried on for, for, for a couple of generations because people were told, when, when they would send our children to boarding school, mm -hmm. the children would go there and said, you can't speak your language, you can't mm -hmm. practice any of your culture. And if they did, they were punished for it. Wow. So an entire generation of people were taught that right. they, what they, who they were, Your their heritage identity is bad. was bad. Mm -hmm. right. So well, self-esteem suffers. And I mean, can you imagine this day and age that somebody would come here into Oklahoma City and say, you can't speak English. You know, you can't live in Oklahoma City. I mean, just think what that would do right. to, to, to uh, our people here. Right. It would devastate them and say, you're going to Wisconsin. Right. or somewhere, they, they wouldn't know how to interact. Or I mean, and again, like Governor said, there's been some that's, I'd say our tribes have been very resilient and, and been that warrior, but, but it's taken a lot to get there, though. I understand. Mike, why don't you kind of bring us home and tell us, like, where we are? Uh, there's a trial date set? Sure. The, uh, <clears throat> the case is set for trial on July the 14th of this year. Uh, before Judge Lee R. West in uh, the federal courthouse in Oklahoma City. And uh, uh, I and some other lawyers will be representing these nations in this lawsuit. The government, the Department of Interior, they have their set of lawyers. Department of Justice has their set of lawyers. The trial will probably last several weeks and the court will determine whether they have to account for this timberland that was sold and uh, we, we are hopeful. Okay, well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Yes, and I was just going to say, I'm sorry, earlier when I said uh, Chim Chim is supposed to be Ome, is you're welcome. <laughs> That's easier to say. Ome, Ome. so Yoko Ki. <laughs> Yome. <laughs>
I say the same, our languages are very close. Okay. 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 And Chapisa Lacho means I'll see you. <laughs> no goodbye. We don't say tall Chickasaw. Oh, I'll see you later. See you I like later. that. Well, gentlemen, I'll see you later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.